Our next guest is a fighter. He's a fighter who leads with his principles and follows them up with a devastating combination of wisdom, courage, and warmth. And that's just unbeatable. He's our brother and we love him. Brother Muhammad Ali. Thank you, Nikki. Thank you for coming very much. I'm really, I'm really interested in Muhammad Ali, the man, since you were a man before you were a boxer. And everybody always takes you into the boxing thing. But you know, I'm from Cincinnati and you're from Louisville. Right. Yeah, My and we used to see your family, your brothers, everybody. I saw Ali's brother today. Right. And we used to be very excited, but I haven't heard much about your father, your brothers lately. How are they? Well, my are father, close to he's him? a commercial artist, and he's, um, he's managing my brother now. My brother's boxing. That's Marcus. And he's doing Rachman. Used Rachman. to be Rudolph, but now it's Rachman. And he's uh, boxing. And he's, uh, he just boxed a few weeks ago in Ohio and a few weeks before that in Chicago. And he's coming up pretty good now. He soon will be one of the top ten heavyweights in the world. Then he have to come and beat you. No, I wouldn't fight my brother. I'd retire. If he got that good. <laughs> If he, if he gets that good, I'll just retire and let him take over. I've been here long enough. <laughs> That's great. You and Belinda have three children? Yes, we have three little girls and one something four months on the way. <laughs> one in the hatch. <laughs> <laughs> You've been into the father role lately. You got any advice you want to give them on how to rear a kid? Well, I don't know. All I know about is girls, and they give me all the trouble I want. <laughs> You know, I'm never home much, and they don't know me. My Miriam, the older one, know me, but the Rishim and Jamila, they don't know me too well. They're about a year old, and, and they give me a lot of trouble when I pick them up, but I have to start staying home more. But uh, I don't know too much. I like to, um, I think that the wife or the mother should train them, and when, by the time they're three years old, they should be ready to go to some type of school with enough home training to give them a good start. That's very nice. Mm -hmm. So can we talk about the wide world of sports? You right. don't want to talk Anything about Anything you want to talk okay, about. Okay, because I don't know. know how you felt about that. I saw the uh, fight. I think they did it Sunday, something like that. And right. they had you box, and they said, well, it wasn't important enough to show the whole fight, but they'd show a little bit. And then they laid some music behind it. Was it shuffling along? Oh, yes. You're referring to Howard Cosell. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> yes, he mentioned that the fight was a forest and that it uh, shouldn't be shown on TV and to show you how bad it was, they put music to it relating to certain moves and positions. But I consider uh, the critics of the fight real hypocritical and the reason they were hypocritical was because of Buster Mathers. Uh, in the twelfth round he was semi-unconscious, he was right on his feet, he was out ready to fall and everybody was saying, kill him, kill him, you got him, you got him. And I just didn't feel right, you know, two black men standing there killing each other just, just, just for dominantly a white audience. And, you know, to be paid $300,000 next day and Uncle Sam take about 60% of it before I get it. <laughs> so uh, I figured, well, since they criticize boxing so much, saying boxing is brutal and fighters have died with brain concussions and hemorrhages and some precautions should be taken, I figured the best precaution would be if a man knows he's winning, he's got the fight under control, he see the man is hurt, and just lighten up and not try to kill him or hurt him. So I did this. I've been, I've been, I've been criticized when I fought Floyd Patterson for being brutal and cruel, brutal and Ernie Terrell and Henry Cooper and many people. And they said you wouldn't serve your country, wouldn't go to the army, but yet you can get in the ring, you fight and kill. So I figured well been uh, showing humanity and compassion for the fellow man and lightening up on him is just a sport event. Maybe I would get a lot of honor and praise, but I caught more hell for not trying to really hurt him. So uh, from now on, I'm here to announce, uh, like I did on Johnny Carson another night, there'll be no more lightening up since the, <laughs> so the next time I'm gonna knock him down and if he gets up, I'm gonna try to knock him down again. If he gets up, I'm gonna knock him down again. If a referee don't stop it, it's not my fault. If the judges don't stop it, if his wife or his ch children don't jump in the ring and stop it, it's not my fault. <laughs> See, because I'm not gonna take the blame for putting on phony fights, a fixed fight, a forest fights that's not fit to be on TV. Show you how hypocritical they are. They gave me hell for being rough and violent. And then when I showed uh, compassion and humanity, they gave me more hell, saying the fights ain't worth being showing. 
So since now I have them on the spot, and if somebody get hurt the next time, they can't say that it's my fault because they gave me hell for trying to be human. Now, I think men wide world of sports, we get along real well, how we co-sell. And one reason I love wide world of sports, I love working with them, was because mainly the poor people got a chance to see my fights and the crippled people in the hospitals because the fights were like cheapest tickets of like $20 when I fight in some theaters. Ringside seats have went up to $1,000 a seat. So, and, and the average seats go up to like $200 a seat. I mean, ringside. So, by wide world of sports, showing the fight, crippled people and people who had all type handicaps, couldn't walk, paralyzed people, could sit at home and watch the fight a few days after. So, I think it's bad that Howard Cosell or anybody at wide world of sports would make a decision for the whole public and keep the fights off TV just because they don't think the fighter is qualified. The promoter thought the fight was qualified enough to guarantee me 300000 and they're guaranteeing the heavyweight champion of Germany 150000 and me 300000 next month in Zurich, Switzerland. How wide world of sports says it's not fit to be shown. Or why is it that the German Commission okayed it, the Swiss Commission okayed it, all the boxing signs of the the world located. They put up $450,000 in advance. And who's why World of Sports or Howard Cosell to say the fight's not fit to be seen? They should let all the people take a vote and say that we don't like the fight. This is the only thing I hate about it. And since, since I caught since I've caused so much hell for trying to be nice and taking it easy on the man, look out from here on because I'm going to be blasting. I'm going to knock. I'm going to hit him. I'm going to fight until he falls. If he gets up, I'm going to knock him down again. And if anything happens, they can't say nothing else because they got on me for not being rough enough. You understand? So look out, whoever the next man is. He is in trouble. <laughs> before, before, say, the championship fight with, uh, with Joe Frazier, I never considered... I, and then even then, but I never considered you like a brutal fighter. And I don't want to say it like that, but I thought you outpointed Frazier. Right. Well, you know, I, thought I thought I won nine style, rounds. Yeah. I, I've seen people protest after decisions, and it really don't help. So I'll just do better next time. I, don't, I think I played too much with Joe Frazier. I played three rounds I shouldn't have played. I didn't stay on my feet and move like I should have. And trying to prove he couldn't hurt me standing in the corners. And this, I lost a fight like this. Judges took it. And one judge gave him... 11 rounds of me, just four. But uh, at the time, I hadn't won my draft case and been one black man in the million dollar bracket who tells it like it is and, you know, stays with his own kind. Naturally, they're going to pick the best boy to give it to him. <laughs> <laughs> but the next time, I've learned a lesson. The next time, there will be no doubt, <laughs> for he must go out. <laughs> I don't want to say it, but he went to the hospital for about three well, weeks. Well, he's okay now. Joe, he had a <laughs> uh, You know, I don't want to boast about nothing like that, but he took a, he won the decision, but he took a terrible whooping. And uh, he, uh, he's, he's recuperated now. And the next time, it'll be better, but I hope he's all right physically. He hasn't fought since uh, the fight. He hasn't and been I'm seen much since the fight. fight. <laughs> well, he's been trying, I mean, singing. Yeah. <laughs> He's a pretty good singer. We can't get on him. He's a brother. He fought good. He can't box. He has no skill, but he hits hard. <laughs> he takes a lot of whooping. He takes a lot of whipping, and he hits real hard. He hits awful hard. He hit me so hard in the 12th round at Job McKim folks in Africa. <laughs> yeah, there's some talk that Joe might retire. No, I don't think he'll I retire really, because it's bad. it'll be bad on his image in the future to be a heavyweight champion and win the title and then get out and retire like you can't, like you're not good enough to hold it. Like after I beat Liston, the people weren't satisfied to beat him twice. Then had to beat Floyd Patterson and then Joy Chevallo in Canada, then Henry Coop in London, then Carl Miltenberg in Germany, then had to defend against Brian London in London, then had to come fight Cleveland Williams in Houston, back to Houston with Ernie Terrell, then had to come back to New York with Zor Folan, then they believed I was champion. So he beat me once, now he's got to beat me twice. Then after he beat me twice, there's going to be some who say, well, he was off three years. Uh, I don't believe he's really that good. Let me see him whoop somebody else. It takes about three years to really be, get established as a champion. And for him to retire now, it would really hurt him. What do you think the future of boxing is? I don't know too much about it. Boxing is going to have to <laughs> mainly, you have to have different contenders. They say boxing is dead now. It's because too many black people uh, rule it. <laughs> 
No, this is nothing like you go watch a basketball game in the high school and the same team split up and play each other. There's no interest. So out of town schools got to come in our college. And one side's rooting for their champion. When Nino Benvenuti was the middleweight champion of the world, or half Italy flew over to root for their champion. <laughs> when Dick Tiger was the title holder in Nigeria and Hogan Kid Bassett, all Africa was watching the fights. And when Oscar Bonavino fought me in the garden, everybody from Argentina and the whole country, even the president said, if he can whip me, they'll meet him at the airport. <laughs> See, like, it's interesting when you got different races and nationalities competing, but when one race dominates, which is us, then it's dead. <laughs> you understand? <laughs> Like when I fought Jerry Quarry, who was a white Irishman in my comeback, or in Atlanta, that was a big fight. Yeah, then when I fought Buster Mathers, it was a farce, cause two black men, mainly one of them not want to kill other, and that's going too far there. You know, <laughs> well, you're probably right. I remember we started integrating churches, they said God was dead. Yeah. <laughs> Same old crack. <laughs> <laughs> what, what advice would you like to offer the young, the young guys coming up? that are interested in sports? Well, I wouldn't advise none of them to be an athlete because it's too risky, you know, like, I'm one of the best and I've got a break, Joe Frazier got a break, but like, if you have an accident or you break a leg or you, or you don't have the talent you should have, you spend your life trying and the next thing you know, you're in a certain age bracket, you didn't make it and life, they consider life a tragedy. One thing for sure, if they go to school, learn to read, learn to write, take up some type of occupation and use their brains and not their fists. If they have anything to do with boxing, be the manager, because usually they get all the money. <laughs> but don't, the fight in itself, or being an athlete, I wouldn't advise no young black man to be. Now that black people are coming into power, and now that they're becoming independent and starting to think in the way of self, we need electricians, we need mechanics, we need doctors, we need nurses, we need scientists. And this is what uh, this is it. I advise them. I advise them to, at uh, three years old, start watching Sesame Street. I'll sit up and watch it. I love Many it. more shows. You really can learn. It's cute the way they put them things together. And uh, I've, my little daughter watches it, and she's getting so smart. She knows everything about it. And like and then she's going to school. But I advise them all to get all the education and learn to read and learn to spell, mainly. That's something most black people don't get too hip to is reading and spelling. <laughs> Something I can't do right now, and I advise them all to do that. You're a poet, and you're talking like that. What? You can read and spell. Well, I know, but I mean, like, I I got common sense, see? <laughs> but I have people help me with my spelling. <laughs> you're serious. Yeah, I'm serious. I'm a bad speller too. Did you hear about the first army test they gave me? I failed two of them. <laughs> they said I was phys I'm mentally unable until they heard I was a Muslim. Then I was smart, but before that. <laughs> Before that, That's they didn't true. want me. And the reporter said, I thought you said that you would... No, he said that, you mean you failed your mental test after it came out one in Houston, then they tried me again in Louisville with psychiatrists. And you know how many, if I had 12 apples and three-fourths was taken and one-fifth got lost, how many was left? How did I know that was an all that? <laughs> and I announced all that. And I failed the test. I failed the test, you understand? And the man said, y you mean you failed the test? I said, I told you I was the greatest, not the smartest. <laughs> <laughs> I know I'm not supposed to crack up, but you're, you're, you're marvelous. <laughs> no. I must say, I, I really adore Thank you. And you. I think Thank that I speak for probably... I, Thank you. You're a wonderful image to us all Thank and an inspiration. You. you know, you really are. I'd like to reintroduce my earlier guests, the Delphonics, Wilbur Hart, Wilbur, William Hart, and Major Lance. I really like them, too. Right. Young men, bright, sexy young men who sing a mean song. <laughs> The Dell Phonics. <laughs> Thank you, Dell Phonics. Thank you very much. That's Major Harris, William Hart, <laughs> and Wilbur Hart. I'm showing my age. Major Lance was a long time ago. <laughs> I'm getting to be an old woman. And I think, like most old women, you have to reflect at some point. I wrote a book called Gemini sort of to bring people up to date, at least on what I think I am, which is not quite, I'm sure, the whole truth. It never is. No reason I should be any different. I got my fantasies. So I wanted, I wanted to read a part of the essay, Gemini, from the book, Gemini, trying to deal with us. But if black men 
ever would decide to define a black man in black terms, I think they would have different expectations of us as women. I went to the opening of an African exhibit at the Brooklyn Museum and noticed only about a dozen black men in a crowd of at least 200 people. And I thought to myself, how odd, no black men. Then I looked at the exhibit piece by piece and began to think I understood something. There was a beautiful door from the Congo. And looking at that door, I saw a man, a woman, several children in the yard, and this white man saying, your door is an excellent example of the Kashana people's art, and I must take it back to Amsterdam. And this beautiful African, barefoot, with perhaps an earring in his left ear, replies, but this door is the door to my house, and it is not for sale. And the woman, sensing something, stops the grinding of grain and begins gathering the children around her, while the white man goes on with, I must have the door. The museum needs it, and I can make 50 dinars on it. And the African rises to his full height on his long, light legs, tribal markings dancing slightly on his face, eyes clear and hard, saying, my family needs this door. It is mine. My father left it to me as his father did him. You may not have it. It is not for sale. And the cracker turns in a rage to leave. Then two, perhaps three days later, later the missionary comes up saying, my son, your door is needed in a great country far away from here. You will be... You will be blessed by our Heavenly Father if you give your door to the merchant. And this magnificent African stooping by his doorway, playing with one of his children, shakes his head. I would be cursed by my ancestors. Go now, go away and leave us in peace. Then in the night, the soldiers come with the guns. The African responds with a spear. The fire ack acts from the barrel. The woman screams. The children scatter, asking what is the matter. The man is stretched out in a pool of dark, murky liquid, and the door is taken down hoisted upon the shoulders of the black mercenaries, walked to the sea and freighted back to Amsterdam so that it can be borrowed by the United States of America to show, the peop to show how the people in Kashana lived in 1582. And I began to understand why so few black men had come, because it was not a door at all, but dead ancestors murdered in their homes that they would see. Not a statue from Nigeria, but a raped woman, a slit throat, a burned village. And even as I saw that, I knew I would never understand the reality of being a black man. Men grow beards to protect the throat, have hair on their chest to protect the heart, have afros to cushion the head blows. And these, can, and these things become aesthetically acceptable, if not preferable, but they always have their groundings in survival. My man and I can walk down the street together, and if some guy says something out of the way to me, it's an insult. To him, it could be his life. I can walk away from words and gestures and still be a woman. He cannot and still be a man. So little of a black man's existent re existence relies on his acts. His women, mothers, sisters, lovers control his life, and generally so irresponsibly that it can be frightening. And sometimes black women aren't very nice for a lot of reasons. And sometimes we use our power against him for a lot of reasons. And I think some of the hostility is real and must be related to as such. We're angry and so are they, but it's only when we admit it that we can get anywhere. I don't think a woman cares where she walks if you let her walk with you. And I don't think a man cares that a woman talks if, she, if she'll talk to him. And if we really understand we are born men and women, and it's our choice whether or not we stay that way, I think a lot will change. If now isn't a good time for the truth, I don't see when we're gonna to get to it, because I don't want my son to be a warrior, or to go to some school where some insensitive teacher asks him why I'm not married, or where some cracker thinks he can run my son down anytime, any kind of way he pleases. We need some happiness in our lives, some hope, some love. I didn't have a baby to see him be cannon fodder. Cannon fodder. Something more must be decided. If it's a real war, then he must be brave and true. If it's a mental war, he must be black and proud. But if it's, if it's the wake the people up war, Martin Luther King did that. Malcolm X did that. Stokely Carmichael did that. Rap Brown did it. And if people aren't awake, then perhaps the dreams are too good to be disturbed again. Perhaps black people don't want revolution at all. That too must be considered. And I decided to be a writer because people kept asking what would I become? And I couldn't see anywhere to go intellectually and thought I'd take a chance on feeling. I didn't want to get married, buy a five-room house in the suburbs, and have lunch at, a Cap at Caproni's as my big event of the month. I could see becoming a bored, alcoholic social worker with a couple of kids I didn't want by a man I barely spoke to and wondering at 35 what I'd done with my life. The second greatest thing that happened to me was getting kicked out of Fisk University because I had to deal with my life. I could go back to school, join Delta Sigma Theta, marry a Meharry man, and go quietly insane. <laughs> or I could go on to live. 
And I think I wanted to be famous because my mother deserves to have the world notice her existence. And my family has worked too hard to be ignored. I don't think I would have cared much if it hadn't been for them, but they deserve more. Other people put a lot of time and energy into me, and they, de and they deserve something too. And love means nothing unless we are willing to be responsible for those who love us, as well as those whom we love. People don't just love you out of the blue, you let them. And people have loved me when I needed to be loved. So as an adult, I must give some of that love back to those who want it, or it would have all have been for nothing. I think I'm no different from any other colored girl who has to grow up and make, de and make decisions and live by them. I think we are all capable of tremendous beauty once we decide we are beautiful, or of giving a lot of love once we understand love is possible, and of making the world over in that image if we choose to. I really like to think a black, beautiful, loving world is possible. I really do, I think. <laughs>